First, it's awe-inspiring to be sitting in the building, the place that Rabbi Gordon was so instrumental in building, which became a symbol for all of us. A few months ago, we stayed on that dark day at a funeral. It's the first time I've been back in the valley since day, since that day. So I say I feel a sense of awe for a dear friend who passed away and a, a man who was a great leader for the Jewish people and revolutionized Judaism in the valley. I would also like to mention that tonight is the second yard site of Rabbi Yosef Loshak, who was the pioneer of Yiddishkeit in Santa Barbara, the Chabad Shliach in Santa Barbara. But what we're really here tonight is to remember that it's 22 years, 22 years since we stood with a great sense of sadness, that we've been since then orphans, and it's been a hard time. But if you look around also, we all know what the prophets of doom and gloom said on the weeks that were passing after the Rebbe's passing, that Chabad would cease to be. The New York Times reporter Ari Goldman, he went on public television, Charlie Rose, he says it's gonna disintegrate. And today we see the opposite. Wherever you go, I was this weekend, I was in Oxnard, I was in Camarillo this morning. Every other exit in the freeway, there's a vibrant, dynamic Chabad center. On Gimel Tamas, there was 1,032 shluchim in the world. And today there's over 4,300 couples and maybe next week there'll be 4,400 couples. When I wrote this book, The Secret of Chabad, I sat down with my friend Dennis Prager one day in his house and he says to me, Reb David, you have to call it inside the world's most successful Jewish movement. I said, Dennis, isn't that a big pretentious? He says, David, it's true. So we are here now. And we're seeing 22 years later what it says to us in the Talmud, if the students of a great rabbi are alive, if they continue to teaching his ideals, his principles, he too is alive. But it wasn't always that way. I want to tell you a story that happened in 1973. A young rabbi called Yisrael Rubin was dispatched to, as many other Chabad rabbis were, to Albany, New York. And when he arrives in Albany, he tells the community, I'm here as a shliach of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. In those days, there was no C-teens. I met some of the C-teens here tonight. Let's give it up for the C-teens. There was no, and I want to put a plug into it, there's going to be next month in, in, in Palm Springs, the National Jewish Retreat. There was no Chabad.org. There was no nothing. It was, a Chabad rabbi was like a novelty. And what was traditional Judaism in Albi in 1973? A few old Jews that had a minion on Shabbos morning and eat a good geschmack a piece of herring. And that was the whole enchilada. And they asked Rabbi Reuben, why are you here? I'm here to spread Judaism. He didn't know exactly what he was supposed to do. They couldn't figure out what he was gonna do. And they, they were both a little bit lost and he was trying to figure out how to get things started. He's there six months and he gets an envelope in the mail. And he opens it up and there's a check for $300. Now, $300 in 1973 is like $2,000 today. He gets all excited. I got a big supporter. He picks up the phone. He calls the guy, the numbers on the check. You've gotten those phone calls. Hi, it's Rabbi so-and-so. I'd love to have a conversation with you. So he tells him he'd like to speak to me. He says, Rabbi, don't get so excited. He says, what do you mean? He says, when you came to town, we made a betting pool. And I said, he's not going to last more than a week. And my friend said that. So I said, you know what? If he lasts six months, I'm sending him a donation for $300. <laughs> the Rebbe brought about a revolution in the Jewish world. He transformed Jewish life. He transformed our lives. He imbued us with amazing ideas. And I want to share with you tonight, when I wrote this book, I struggled to understand what the Rebbe tried to accomplish and what stood behind it. And I think one can could, one, one could make a strong argument that what the Rebbe did, he had big ideas, and I want to share with you what I think are six of those big ideas that revolutionize Judaism in the world today and can inspire us in our own lives. And many of these ideas are already inspiring us even if we don't realize it. But to understand these ideas, I want to take you back a little bit in history to January of 1951. It had been a year since the passing of the previous Rebbe, who was a heroic figure. He stood up to communism. He was sentenced to death. He was a man of unbelievable courage. He came to America broken, not healthy, no followers, 
very small, a few Hasidic families in the whole country, and he says, I'm going to change, I'm going to change Judaism in America, and that's exactly what he did. He laid the foundation for that. But a year had passed, and the Hasidim had been lobbying his son-in-law, who at that time they called him the Ramash after his name, that he should become the Rebbe. And it was the first yard site, and that night would be the critical night. Would the Rebbe become Rebbe or not? And the way a person becomes a Rebbe, there's no ceremony, there's no this or there's no that. A Rebbe becomes Rebbe when he utters and teaches a, a mimer Hasidic, Hasidus, a Hasidic discourse, a deep teaching of the esoteric and mystical dimensions of Judaism. And the excitement was in the air. Now you have to understand where all of this happened. That it happened in the small shul when you walk into 770 Eastern Parkway on the right side. The room is 620 square feet. The stage I'm standing on is 200 square feet. The lobby may be 600 square feet. Chabad was a little tiny shtibel in Brooklyn with a few hundred Jews pushed and shoved into it. That's where the Rebbe started, in a tiny little place. And I want to share with you what he said that night, and I'm paraphrasing. So before he said the mimer, he said like this, he says, in America is the Haminic, it's a custom in America. Before you begin something new, that you begin making a statement. At the end of the sentence that he said in Yiddish, he threw in the word statement. And then he began with his mission statement. He says, in Judaism, we have three Abbas, three kinds of love, three things that Jews are committed and responsible for. You have Abbas Hashem, the central pillar of Judaism. We have to love, our, we have to love God. We have Abbas Atera, the idea of loving Torah. And we have Abish Yisrael, we have to have care and compassion for the, our fellow Jew, for our fellow human being. And then as they say in America, came the kicker. And I'm paraphrasing the where Rebbe's words. He says, you can have the Abish Hashem, you can spend your day meditating and praying and be involved with in your spiritual activities. You can have the Abish Atayra, you can decide to spend all of your life dedicating for Torah study, which is a very admirable thing to do. But if you don't have the Abish Yisrael, if you don't have that care and compassion for another Jew, if then your Avis Hashem and Avis Atayra, your loving of God and your loving of Torah is deficient, it has a weakness, it's not strong, it's not the way it should be. What the Rebbe did was take the idea of responsibility for another human being and put it center stage. And his revolution was to change Jews one by one and eventually bring about a revolution in the world. And I learned this story so amazingly last October in Israel. There had been a delegation gone from the United States representing the major religious movements, let's call it, here in American Jewish life, 10 people. And I was asked to go on this, on this trip together uh, as a representative of Chabad. And the idea was to have private meetings with the government of Israel, because as you know, mar parts of the Jewish community were very much, let's say, not supportive. They were, very, they were not supportive of the Israel's position on the Iran agreement. And it was a lot of blunt conversation, and it was off the record, and there was no publicity. And we went in to have a meeting with Michael Oren. He's sitting on one side of the table. We're sitting on the other side of the table. Literally, the, 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 the people representing the bulk of Jews in America affiliated with, from one end of the spectrum to another in the Jewish community, from the most liberal to the most orthodox. And we have a very direct conversation. He says, I'm very disappointed in you. You let us down. It was very intriguing. And as this conversation is finishing, he turns to me and he starts talking to me about Rabbi Shalom Gordon, Rabbi Josh Gordon's father. Now, two months earlier, he had done a book tour and he had been in the Nixon Library, the Presidential Library in Orange County, and we had talked for a few moments, we had met a few other times, and I said to him, you mentioned Rabbi Gordon in the book, and he says, of course, and that was the end of the conversation. But now he picks up on that conversation for two months earlier, and there you have the head of the reform movement, and the conservative movement, the reconstructionists, and the orthodox, and what does Michael Oren want to talk about? He says, when I was a young teenager, I would study Talmud every week, once or twice a week with Rabbi Gordon, Rabbi Sholem Gordon, Oliver Sholem, the great Shlia from Maple, who was in New Jersey, the grandfather of the Gordon family, which is here today. And it was Rabbi Gordon who instilled in me my Jewish identity. It was Rabbi Gordon who inspired me to be a proud Jew. It was Rabbi Gordon who motivated me to be committed to the Jewish people. A chassid learning Talmud with a teenager in New Jersey produced one of the greatest spokesmen who speaks with pride for the Jewish people, Michael Oren, who served admirably as the Israeli ambassador to the United States. 
That's how you change Judaism, one person at a time. And this is what the Rebbe taught us to do. We also have to understand, I want to, uh, what was stacked, what was the Rebbe's position at this time? The deck was stacked against him. The great Jewish sociologist Marshall Square wrote in the 1950s that Orthodox Judaism, and this is what he wrote, was a case study in institutional decay. Traditional Judaism, everybody was running away to the suburbs. Ah, that was good for my grandparents, for the Bubbas and the Zaydas, etc., etc. Nobody could envision that Yiddishkeit would come back and be strong. So here the Rebbe lays out is the first big idea, this sense of responsibility to transform Judaism one Jew at a time. And at the end of the Fabrengen, he says something else, which is of paramount importance, and goes to the central foundation of Chabad's approach to avoid this Hashem, to serving God above. He says it's known about the Rebbes of Lubavitch that they're not here to do, but they're here to help. He says everybody has to do their own emotional, spiritual lifting. Each person has to serve God. It has to be We have to internalize the ideas of Judaism. We have to make them the core of our existence. We have to make them who we really are. What is the role of the Rebbe? To give you a blessing, to give you direction, to give you advice. But who is going to make you into the kind of Jew you are? It's you, yourself, and no one else. You can come to shul on a Shabbos morning, feel uplifted by singing Adon Olam, walk out of the building, and it has no impact on you because you've never internalized everything anything. That ever wanted Jews who would internalize ideas. There was a rabbi called Reform uh, Herbert Wiener. He was a very intriguing reform rabbi. He wrote a book in the 1960s. It came out called Nine and a Half Mystics. I suggest it as an intriguing read. He wrote about some of the great religious teachers of Judaism in the mid-century and he spent an exorbitant amount of time writing and commenting and talking and speaking and interviewing with the Rebbe. And one day he goes in, Herbert Wiener, and by the way, at the end of his life, just before he retired from his reformed temple in, uh, in New Jersey, the Rebbe told him, you need to tell everybody you're really an Orthodox Jew. And he got up at the final closing event at the dinner where they were saying, you did a great job, he's going off to retire, and he says, I have to tell everybody I'm really an Orthodox Jew. And the members of the board said, we always knew that. This was Herbert Wiener. So Herbert Wiener goes into the Rebbe for a private meeting, and he had a certain degree of what we call chutzpah, Audacity, or Rabbi Morty calls it temerity. You may have three other cinnamons also. I'm not sure which of the other oh, they are. But nevertheless, a little bit of chutzpah. And he says to the Rebbe like this. He says, people come to you, they ask you this question and that question and this question and that question. He says, aren't you really just creating a bunch of robots? Aren't you just creating a bunch of people who just do whatever you say? And the Rebbe quickly responds back to him. You can send them wherever you want in the world and they will be as they are here. They will be chassidim. They can come to your Belinda or Tarzana or Kathmandu and they can raise their children and you think they were brought up in Brooklyn or in Muncie or wherever you are. Because when you internalize Judaism and you make it real, then it becomes the essence of who you are. And the Rebbe's sixth, second big idea is Judaism has to be something that we have to struggle with ourselves and make it the core of our personality. But the question is, now you realize your responsibility for others, and you understand that you have to internalize Judaism, but what are you supposed to do about that? The Lord, the Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, it's a long, interesting title, who, by the way, he beat me out in the National Jewish Book Award. My book was a finalist, his book was the winner. Hopefully next time around I may become knighted by the queen, and then I'll win around the next book, I'll win the, I'll win the award. But nevertheless, he said a very powerful statement. He said, good leaders create followers. Great leaders create leaders. In the mid-1970s, the Rebbe wanted to give a kickstart to Chabad in Israel. The Hasidim that had gathered in Brooklyn since that tremendous night in 1951, they got the Rebbe's agenda. They had the passion. They had the energy. The Israelis were separated by oceans. This was before the time of internet. They were moving along in the agenda, but as they say in English, they needed a kick in the pants. So the Rebbe took 25 young couples and another 20 or so yeshiva bakram in the years 75, 74, 70, around the mid-70s, he moved, has them all moved to Israel. And if you go to Israel today, they all have positions of leadership. One is the chief rabbi of Halon, one is the chief rabbi of Alat, the other runs big institutions in this city. They all took major positions of leadership. And the whole idea was to take Chabad to a whole new level. One of them was a very, is a dear friend of mine, 
who today is a rabbi in Rehovot. He gets married to an Israeli girl and he becomes the assistant to a very important chassid in Israel, a Jew called Reb Zusha the Partizan. Who was Reb Zusha? He had, been, he, the reason, he, he had been a partisan. Many of you may have seen the movie Defiance in the Belsky Partisans. And he was the tumbler, the strasher. He was the guy who got things done for Chabad in Israel. He was already a little bit older. And Reb Mendel went to work for him as a young kid, 26, 27. He goes to work for him. And they were tasked with the responsibility to travel Israel from the north to the south, from Atula to Elat, and do an evaluation of all the Chabad institutions. Now today you go to Israel, we have over 600 Chabad institutions. But in 1976, 78, whatever it was, the numbers were nowhere near that. So they travel on this trip, and they, take, they visit all the institutions, and Mendel is given the responsibility, he's going to New York, to write a report to the Rebbe about the problems that they found in the various institutions. And he writes an eight-page report on the plane. He's so proud of himself. I'm coming back to New York. I'm writing the report. It's so important. I'm doing this very important thing. And he, and he, and he writes this report. He comes into New York. He presents it to the Rebbe's office. He's expecting to get an answer. And this city where you have this problem, you'll do this. And that city where you have that problem, you'll do that. And he figures the Rebbe's going to give him advice what to do in every town after another. So what happens? He comes every day to the office. They say, in Yiddish, Gordon, no answer. He's about to leave back to Israel. He's getting into the taxi. He's a little depressed. He didn't get an answer from the Rebbe. His brother calls from the window and says, Mendel, there's an answer. Stop at 770. Stop at the Rebbe's office on the way to Kennedy, on the way to the airport. He tells the taxi driver to stop. He runs into the office. He tells the Rebbe's secretary, I heard there's an answer. The Rebbe's secretary pulls out the eight-page report and in pencil on the side of the report, the Rebbe writes in Hebrew and I'm going to translate to English. All of the things which he writes about in this, in, in this report are very important. Many of them need to be rectified. The question is, what is he going to do about it? Question mark, apostrophe, question mark, apostrophe. <laughs> Mendel at this point is befuddled, betwixt, etc., etc. He copies down the answer. He jumps in the taxi. He goes on the plane. And somewhere over the Atlantic, he has an epiphany. He realizes, yes, till now, I said to myself, I came to the big state of Israel, a country with millions of people. Who am I, little Mendel Lukowski? I'm going to merely make a difference. I was like some guy sitting at the stands watching the players on the field. I didn't get the whole point. The Rebbe wanted me to take leadership. What are you going to do about it? How, what are, are you going to step forward? Are you going to sit by the sides and fetch? You know, in every shul, there's three guys in the back. They know everything that's going to happen in the universe. They know who's going to win the election. They know if the kugel in shul last week was no good and why the kugel is no good. They know the rabbi made a speech that was too short. Never happened, by the way, in, in Tarzana. They know everything that's going on, the future of the universe. They have to find the whole future. What the Rebbe wanted was people like ourselves, when we see a problem, to stand up and to do something about it. What are you going to do about it? What are we going to do to become Jewish leaders? But when you become Jewish leaders, what are the limits of that leadership? And this is a very important question. Because you can become Jewish leaders and you can have all kinds of suggestions to do things, but those ideas are not in consonant. They don't reflect the values of Judaism. There's a very interesting story I want to share with you. And what are the limits of that leadership? There was a shliach. He was sent in the early 1960s. It was the fourth regional office of Chabad that was opened up in the United States. And he was sent to Minneapolis in St. Paul. His name is Rav Moshe Feller. I think he may have even visited here in Tarzana once or twice. A wonderful man. He's going off to St. Paul. He had grown up in, in the Twin Cities, and now the Rebbe was sending him back. He had gone to Yeshiva Torah Vadas and then switched to Chabad. And his wife was a Phi Beta Kappa. I think that's how you call, tell, call it in mathematics. And she had landed a job teaching mathematics at the University of Minnesota. So they're going now to open the fourth regional office of Chabad in Minnesota, and the conversation with the Rebbe is really intriguing. The Rebbe turns to Mindy Feller, his wife, and 90% of the time he talks to her about the fact that he is good, they're going to be in Minneapolis, and she has to use her position at the University of Minnesota to influence Jewish academics about, and connect them more with Judaism. And when he finishes having this long conversation with Mindy, he turns to Moshe and he asks him a question. Moshe, do you have a copy of the Code of Jewish Law? Like, get real. What rabbi doesn't have a copy of the Code of Jewish Law? 
And then the Rebbe rattles off the names of two or three classics in Jewish law that everybody has on the shelf in the bookshelf. And Moshe is thinking to himself, what does he want from me? And what does he say? He says, Moshe, du sein flexible. He says, you have a copy of all these books of Jewish law and you should become flexible. What's the message? Push the edge of the creative envelope, but always keep the rules. Realize that you have to operate within the framework of Jewish tradition. That we're not going to do something, we're not going to do an event that's not kosher because it's not comfortable to do an event that's not kosher. We're not going to break Jewish law. When you go out there to spread Judaism, you have to watch a fine line between creativity and tradition, between loyalty to Jewish tradition and finding all kinds of new ideas to draw Jews closer to Judaism. In the mid-1970s, I think it was the mid-1970s, we had the Iranian hostage crisis. And all we all know, many of us know the story, many of us were alive there, some of us were not, but nevertheless, the Iranians had captured many Americans, it was a tragic time. And the President of the United States at that time was Jimmy Carter, he basically locked himself in the White House, he was very depressed. And Rabbi Avram Shemtev, one of the senior statesmen of the Chabad movement, had arranged to put a Hanukkah menorah in front of the White House on Lafayette Park, he had done it for a few years. And they invited the President to come out to the menorah lighting. And the first time ever, and the last time since, now every year somebody comes, Vice President Biden came two years ago, that this guy comes, you know, some senior official in the administration. But never before, never since, and never after, was a President of the United States that he agreed to come to a Hanukkah menorah lighting in front of the White House. And here they are, they're about to light the menorah, and it's the fifth night of Hanukkah, and President Carter, and we have, there's a lot of other issues we got with President Carter about how what he did for Israel, whatever, but loves us up, as they say in English. We'll leave that aside for tonight. And what happens is Carter turns to Rabbi Shemtev and he says to him something interesting. He says, Rabbi Shemtev, it's five, why are you only lighting five candles? He says, it's the fifth night. He says, can't we light eight candles and bring more light into the world? He was depressed. He was upset with what was going on. He had locked himself in the White House. Can't we bring more light in the world? And Shemtev is in a dilemma. The President of the United States wants him to light a menorah with eight. It's only the fifth night of Hanukkah. He's thinking to himself, it's only a rabbinic tradition. He doesn't know exactly what to do. He says, you know what, Mr. President, we have two menorahs. We have the tall menorah on top, and we have a small menorah in a glass case that we're gonna light with candles, and this child is gonna light that. Let's ask the kid to light all the eight candles. He says, you know what, Rabbi, that's a great idea. They light the eight candles, everything is wonderful, the president is happy, and Rabbi Shemtev writes a report to the Rebbe. And he tells him the whole story, and the Rebbe gives out an answer, and Rabbi Shemtev shared it with the shluchim because we need to learn this important lesson. He says, I thought you would have had the Gon Yaakov. I thought you would have had the strength of character. I thought you would have understood the purpose of your mission is not to compromise a principle of Jewish law, even a custom for the President of the United States. What the Rebbe's important principle here is that we should be flexible, we should be creative. We all, we have to understand, we have to understand what are the limits of what we did. And this brings us to a very other important idea of the Rebbe. A very powerful idea. The challenge for us of Jews in America is so different than the challenge of our great-grandparents and the great-great-grandparents who lived in some little shtetl and little village in Poland or Russia or Morocco or Tunis, wherever they could have been. There they had no freedom of opportunity. Here, they, there they could only live in certain places. They could only practice certain kinds of jobs. They were, they, their lives were limited. But Baruch Hashem, we live in a country that gives us rights and freedoms to do whatever we want to do. The first time Jews were ever given full, full civil rights was when the Bill of Rights was written here in the United States. Even Napoleon in the early 1800s, when he wanted to be nice to the Jews, what did he do? He said, Jews, but you have to be Frenchmen first and Jews second. In America, Jews were allowed to live their lives to the fullest. And we see this tremendous story here with, President, with Joe Lieberman, who ran for Vice President of the United States, and we, people, we respected him because he kept Shabbos and kept kosher. But the question we have is how do we live in a modern world? How do we balance our Judaism and modernity? What are the values that should be preeminent, and what are the values that should be not? And we've seen different responses and reactions to this challenge of modernity. Some have come along in parts of the Jewish community and they've let the values of Western liberal democracy dominate them, their lives and, and so to speak translate them and even come become Jewish values. We have elements, parts of the traditional Jewish community, the more Haredi community. It says, you know what, the Western world is a very dangerous place. I really don't want to deal with it. I'd rather just keep, be, build a moat around myself 
and not interact with the broader world in Israel. Comes the Rebbe with a radical new approach. It's like oil on top of water. You, all, you, you are immersed in the world around you, but you always hold true to your own values. The approach of principled engagement. You know where we see this in such an interesting place is in Israel. All of us know there's a big debate in Israel between secular and religious, and one of the big questions about serving in the army, some people say, I do not want my sons going to the army, they will spend their lives in Torah learning, and it'll be in danger for their Judaism to go to the army. Others are advocating going to the army, and Chabad took a middle ground. It says we want our students to sit and learn Torah, but when they finish, they should go to the army. In other words, it's approach a principled engagement. Why? Because Hasidic philosophy here has a very important perspective that the world itself is holy. And by us going out into that world and transforming that world and making it a holier place, we transform all of society. So we have to deal with the modern world around us, but we have to deal with the modern world always from the, with, with the foundation that the, foundation, that the principles of Judaism have to animate that engagement with the world around us. And finally, we come to the Rebbe's sixth big idea. The Rebbe was not into this just to build Jewish community and build more Chabad houses and beautiful centers. The Rebbe was in this for an end game, to transform the world to a place of goodness and kindness with the coming of Mashiach. The Rebbe wanted us that each one of us have the power of transformation. One more mitzvah, one more study of Torah, one more act of kindness, one more act of compassion, one more act of holiness. That could be the tipping point to bring Mashiach and take the world from Gullahs, from Diaspora, to a sense of redemption, to Geula. So we have six big ideas. Number one, and these ideas are outlined in the book, that we have to have responsibility for our fellow Jew. There has to have Abish Yisrael. That our service to Hashem has to be with our own internalization of these values. That we all can become leaders. We have to be true to the values of Jewish tradition in Shulchan Aruch. We see, and, we, and, 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 when we, and even though we see the world differently, the world outside of us may be differently, we must engage it, but we engage it with Torah as the values that animate it. And finally, my friends, that we all can change the world for good. I want to share with you three more stories. And I want to share with you the powerful ideas between these stories. I was sitting, I was sitting talking to Rabbi Herzog here about my daughter. She got kidnapped by a boy who took her to Australia. You know, that happens. Your daughter gets married, and what you get is beautiful grandchildren. So I got a few beautiful Aussie grandchildren. I actually have two children that are living in Australia, both married to Aussies. Anyway, my, you know we have Chabad of Tarzana, and Chabad of Yorba Linda. And Chabad. Last week I spoke to a guy, Chabad of Missoula, Montana, would you believe? Well, my Mechutten, the Mechutten are the outlaws. You know, my, my daughter's father-in-law. He created another Chabad center in, in Australia, which is very unique. He calls it Chabad of Rara, Chabad of rural and regional Australia. What does he do? He takes rabbinical students and young rabbis, and he sends them all throughout Australia, and they visit small Jewish communities. When I was in Australia last January, in Emirates Hashem, I'm going on a book tour to New Zealand and Australia at the end of August, when I was in Australia last, Jan well, it was last January, the boys were there in Melbourne and they told me the story. They went to Darwin. You know, Darwin is in the very north part of Australia. 50 Jews, 90% of the Jewish community turned up for the Hanukkah party. They drove from there to Townsville and Townsville to Melbourne. That's like driving from Chicago to Seattle to Seattle to LA. And along the way, they visited one little Jewish community after another. Well, a couple of years ago, a group of these rabbinical students went to a town called Ballarat. Ballarat is a few hours out of Melbourne. Now, just like California had a gold rush, Australia had a gold rush about 140, 150 years ago. In fact, and, and the gold rush was a tremendous success. If you go to downtown Melbourne right now, next to the parliament, there's a stunning, beautiful synagogue that was built in the 1880s with the gold rush money. And if you go to Ballarat, there's a beautiful synagogue that was built there also in the time, same time by Jews who came there during the gold rush because that was the center of the gold rush. Only one problem, you can't get a minion today on Kol Nidre night in Ballarat. There's no Jews there. There's five, 10, 15 Jews in the whole city. They can't get a minion even once a year. So the boys come to Ballarat like other small Jewish communities and they go visit the Jews they have on the list. And these guys were a little bit industrious. They got hold of something that I haven't seen in a few years. It's called the phone book. And in the phone book, they started looking for Jewish names. And they saw the name Luria. 
Luria, if you open the prayer book that we use in the Chabad synagogues, it says Al Pi Nuschari, according to the teachings of the great Kabbalist who lived four or five hundred years ago, Rabbi Isaac Luria. They figure it, Luria, the guy must be Jewish. They pick up the phone, hello, Mr. Luria, we're rabbinical students from Melbourne, we're traveling around visiting Jews, are you Jewish? He says, yes. He says, can we come visit? He says, of course. They jump into the motorhome, the mitzvah tank on the side, it says, Chabad of Rara. I wanted to go camping with the thing, but the guy won't let me have it, you know? I wanted to go see the mountains in Australia, it's a beautiful place, but no, he says, only you gotta go visit crazy little towns, you can't do it any other way. Anyway, it says Chabad of Rara. They pull up in front of his house, an older gentleman answers the door. He looks at them and he says, where have you been? I've been waiting for you for 70 years. What is the story of Mr. Luria? Mr. Luria's mother was taken into Auschwitz and she was holding under her coat a little baby that was just a week or two old. And when she realized the horrors of Auschwitz, she realized the death and destruction. She took the baby, she smuggled him out of the camp she like threw him over a fence or pushed him through a fence to a farmer nearby. The farmer put the child in an orphanage and somehow with miracles she survived four or five years in the, in the death camps. And after the war she discovered her child in the orphanage and she moved as far away as she could. She says, I'm going to Australia. But she didn't move to Melbourne which has one of the most dynamic and vibrant Jewish communities in the world. He, she didn't move to Sydney. She didn't move to Perth. She didn't, she, she didn't move, she says, I want to get away from it all. She moves to Ballarat, where you can't get a minion on Kol Nidre night. And she told her son two things. Number one, you are a Jew. And number two, you are a descendant of the Holy Rabbi Zik Luria. And on that day, my friends, on that day in Ballarat, and since then he's visited Melbourne to my Mechutin's house for Shabbos. On that day in Ballarat, he had his bar mitzvah and he reconnected with his people. He reconnected with the Jewish people. Story number two. In 2011, Prime Minister Netanyahu makes a speech in the UN, in the General Assembly. And in that speech, he talks about that, he, he does something very interesting. He quotes the Rebbe by name. And what was he referring to? 25 years earlier on a Simchas Torah night, there's a lot of details to the story, Simchas Torah night, he came to the Rebbe, and while 5,000 Hasidim were waiting, the Rebbe spoke to him for close to an hour, and he told him that the UN is a place of darkness, and his mission in life is to go there and speak the truth, and speak up for the Jewish people, and even one candle can, li can, light, can brighten the dark room. But 2011, he gets up there, and he, and he mentions, and he quotes the Rebbe by name, and he says, the Rebbe, Rebbe told me, that when you go into a place of darkness, he said, there's also some nice people in the UN, but you go into a place of lies and darkness, and the UN has much darkness, much lies, one candle can tell the truth. This whole thing caused a tumult in the Chabad community. For the Prime Minister of Israel to quote the Rebbe in the General Assembly of the UN was unprecedented. So I picked up the phone the day after he made the speech, and I called a very dear friend of mine, some of you may know who he is, he passed away a year ago, he was an Israeli ambassador to the, to the United Kingdom and to Australia. He'd been the advisor to five Israeli prime ministers. He had brought Prime Minister Rabin, he had brought Menachem Begin, he had brought Menzalman Shazar to the Rebbe. He was a key figure, his name was Yehuda Avner. He was a very dear friend of mine. He wrote a phenomenal book called The Prime Ministers. And we became very dear friends. One of the great things about writing a book is everybody wants to tell you the story and you make some wonderful friendships. And the most wonderful friendship I made in the process of writing and over the 200 interviews I did for the book was this friendship with Yehuda who passed away last April. And the fact is we have the same publisher. He helped me get that publisher and the publisher agreed to do the book after Yehuda inspired him. So I call up Yehuda. This is the, t this is the insider's insider. He spent 10 years working for Yitzhak Rabin. He spent six, seven years working for Menachem Begin. When Lady Eshkol went to the LBJ ranch and got, and got, LBJ, and got LBJ, President Johnson, to a degree, agreed to give Israel the phantom planes, Yehuda was there taking notes. When Menachem Begin was, was, what's, was, was sitting across the table from Jimmy Carter, who was there sitting next to him, it was, it was Yehuda of Nair. When Menachem Begin made the Camp David agreements, who did Begin send back to brief the Rebbe? The Rebbe was not happy. Was Yehuda of Nair. When Yitzhak Rabin was in the, was in the, uh, was in the ambassador to the United States, who stood by his side for those years? It was Yehuda of Nair. 
So I call him, I say, Rabbi Huda, did you hear what happened? He says, yes. So I said, what do you think? He says, all the pundits in Israel are saying, the academics, you know, the talking heads, just watch CNN for a moment, you know what I'm talking about. All these people who think they're chachamim, benavoinim, they think they understand everything. They say that BB is gonna do something in the next couple of weeks, which is gonna upset the Chabad community very much. So he's decided to mention the Rebbe from the UN podium. So this way the community will be gaga a little bit and he'll placate them. And when he fixes their wagon, they won't be so angry. So I said, what do you think? He says, call me after Yom Kippur. This was classic Yehuda. He never told you the whole story. He had been a secret diplomat for years. I have to tell you a story within a story. One day we were sitting and he told me he was sitting in the room with Menachem Begin when they were attacking the nuclear reactor in Iraq. It was just him and Begin. So I said, and the cabinet was sitting in the next room. It was Arab Shuiz. So I said to Yehuda, what was Begin doing during the attack? He was sitting and saying to Hillam. He was saying Psalms like a religious Jew. But let's go back to this story. So I wait till after Yom Kippur, and I call him up, and I say, "New Rabbi Yehuda, what's, what's going on? Oh, Davidul, Davidul. This is the way he used to talk. I said, Yehuda, you're used to conquering kings and queens, you know. He came to the Queen of England, and, he, and she was astonished. She says, this is the first time we had an ambassador from Israel that was born in Manchester, England, you know. It was an interesting thing. So he says, I, he says to me, I'll tell you what happened. I went to Davin with Netanyahu on Yom Kippur. Now, if you know the geography of Jerusalem, the prime minister's residence is about 200 yards from the great synagogue. But for him to go to the great synagogue on Yom Kippur is a security nightmare. And let's be very honest, Bibi's not the guy who goes to shul every Shabbos. But I heard one of his kids may be religious, but whatever it is, he's a Jew with a strong sense of tradition. But he went to a small shul in Rechavia with maybe 50, 60 people. And Yehuda came to the shul and went to Davin with him. So I said, knew what happened. He, so he tells me there was the break. You know what happens, that every shul has a break. Some have two hours, some have one hour, some have 14 minutes, it depends on the shul. There was a break. Now the prime minister didn't want to walk back, he couldn't drive him in Kipper. He didn't want to walk back to the prime minister's residence, that would have been a security nightmare. So he stayed in the shul during the break. And Rabbi Yehuda goes to the front of the shul and he sits down to schmooze with him. And they're sitting and they're talking and he says, Dad, let me tell you what happened. He says, finally I got to the reason I came to see the prime minister. He says, I turned to Bibi and I said, Bibi, ala Rebbe de Barta. Now let's be honest. Politicians don't always tell the truth. <laughs> but Yom Kippur afternoon, in the break, when it's just a four eyes conversation, there's nobody else there. There's no TV, there's no radio, there's no nothing. It's just two people talking. An old, politi an old ambassador, a veteran politician, a senior statesman, and a prime minister who looked up to him. He says to him, in Hebrew he says to him, Allah Rebbe de Barta, you spoke about the Rebbe? He says, Vadai de Barta Allah Rebbe. He says, Inotan li bashlichut shedi b'chayim. He says, for sure I spoke about the Rebbe. He gave me my mission in life. He gave me my mission in life. This was a four eyes conversation. Story number three. Story number three. About four or five years ago, at Chapman University, which is a very interesting, build, uh, prestigious, uh, small university in Orange County, which in Mirza Shem, in the next couple of months, we're opening up a new Chabad house there. It's a growing school. It's an excellent college. There's, an, there's a very high-end program there for Holocaust studies. And somehow they finagled to bring Elie Wiesel there for a week for one or two years in a row. And Elie Wiesel comes to Chapman University for about 10 days a week. And they decide to have a meeting between him and the local rabbis and there ends up to be about 10 of us. There's me and my son, Shui, who's a rabbi in Chabad of Tustin, and there's about eight or nine reform rabbis in the room. We all know each other, we thank God we all get along well in Orange County, and we have this whole conversation. Now, coming to there, I was thinking to myself, I was driving to Chapman to go to, to, go meet, to, go to this meeting, and I was thinking to myself, you know, I really would like to get Elie Wiesel to talk about his relationship with the Rebbe, but, you know, I called a friend of mine who knew Elie Wiesel, and I said, what do you think? He says, listen, he doesn't like to be pushed around, you gotta be subtle. Okay, so we come there, and Elie Wiesel talks about how he he was he's Shabbos observant, how he completed the study of Talmud. He speaks about Jews need to learn Torah and do mitzvahs, which is very good for these rabbis to hear for sure. It was a great conversation. And then about two-thirds into the hour, and it was supposed to be just a free-flowing conversation, he says, I want to tell you all a story. And what does he tell us? He doesn't tell us all the details. I know a lot of the other details, that after the Holocaust, he didn't want to get married. He basically had given up on life. 
And the Rebbe had encouraged him strongly to get married and pushed him and prodded him to, that he should go re, re, learn to live again. And what happened was, the day he got married in Jerusalem, the Rebbe sent him a bouquet of flowers. So I turn to him and I say to him in Yiddish, I'm sitting three feet away from him, and I say to him in Yiddish, Rebbe Ele, I was I talked to him in kind of like a very kind of Yiddish kind of in, you know like personal kind of way, like we're old buds, even though we really never met before. I said, Rebbe Ele, a chassid will alamo heren amaisa from Rebbe, can't you zogun the chamaisa? I said to him, a chassid always wants to hear a story from the Rebbe. Can you tell another story? So for the rest of the hour, he tells all these reform rabbis one story after another of the Rebbe. At the end of the hour, the things break up. I walk over to him, and we sit down and start to schmooze together in Yiddish. It's like two chassidim having a fabreng. That's what it really, in Chapman University. And I said to him, Rebbe I said, I want to ask you a question. I said, I didn't want to bring it up in front of all these rabbis because I wasn't sure if it's true or not. I didn't want to embarrass you. And I told them I want to ask them a story. And this whole conversation, these rabbis are walking around. You know, they want to take a picture with Eli Wiesel. And the two chassidim are sitting. He's a, he calls himself a vision chassid, the Lubavitch chassid. We're sitting on the side. We're having our own fabrengen all in Yiddish. So I say to him, I, I'll tell you what I said to him. I said, there's a, very, there was a, there's a man called David Nissen, Nesenoff. David Nesenoff, who went with his son to the White House somehow. Well, there was some event there. And what happened, they, were, they met the famous reporter, the AP, UP or AP reporter, Helen Thomas. And you may remember this story. He may have spoke here in, in Chabad of Tarzana. And what happened, they asked her about Jews in Israel. And she says, tell all the Jews in Israel to go back to Europe. Anyway, they got it on YouTube. The, the thing went viral. The whole world went crazy. And Helen Thomas, who has worked in the White House for 50, 60 years, maybe even 100 years the way she looked, she had to resign from her position. So he didn't know, this guy Nisanoff didn't know what to do. And somebody gave him Elie Wiesel's number. And he, he calls him up. He says, Mr. Wiesel, I need your advice. He tells him the whole story. He says, every, every media outlet in the world is calling me. There's a big tumult. What should he do? So Elie Wiesel tells him, you need to know what the Rebbe would tell you what to do. You should call Rabbi Shemtiv in Philadelphia. It's the same Shemtiv who had the story with President Carter. He's one of the senior chassidim. He would know what the Rebbe would want you to do because he has so much experience with the Rebbe and ask his advice. And then Eli Wiesel turns to me, and this is what he says to me first in Yiddish, and I'll translate to English, and he hinted to it in the video that we said. He says, He says, whenever I come to a moment in my life and I don't know what to do, I have to make a moral decision. I have to decide what's right and what's wrong. I ask myself the question, what would the Rebbe tell me to do? What would the Rebbe tell me to do? My friend, three stories with three powerful lessons. Every one of us has a Jew down the block that we have to knock on their door. He'll open it up and he'll say to us, where have you been for 60, 70 years? You don't have to travel to Ballarat. If you want to go to Australia, it's a beautiful country. I've got very cute grandchildren. I can give you their number. You can take pictures for me and send them back. But seriously speaking, you, we, the, 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 the transforming the Jewish people is not just the responsibility of the rabbis and the Rebetzins. And I want to tell you, the team of rabbis and Rebetzins here in the valley are the best we have in the nation. They are the envy of all Chabad rabbis around the world. It's your responsibility. It's your job to find the Jew from Balarat. It's your job to find the Jew who's been forgotten about, who doesn't know, who, who, that uh, nobody remembered. Invite him to your house, give him a Shabbos meal, learn with him a word of Torah, and transform him. The Rebbe wanted us all to become leaders and all to be involved with this idea of responsibility for Jewish destiny. The second point is, it's not just for Bibi Netanyahu to stand up and speak for pride for the Jewish people. It's not just for him to have the strength of conviction to go into the UN, a place of darkness, and bring light. This is the responsibility of every single Jew. The Rebbe wanted us to see our lives, and each one of us are on a shlichus, on a mission, to transform the world to a place of goodness and kindness, to speak truth, to bring light, to bring energy, to bring vitality, and to have pride for the Jewish people and never be embarrassed. And finally, my friends, we all have our moral dilemmas in life. We all have the gray. Life is not black and white. We all have difficult moments. And there's different ways we can make decisions. 
We can make those decisions by saying, oh, this is what I feel like doing. And what does modern Western society say? Let him do whatever he wants as long as he feels good. What is Elie Wiesel telling us? That we need to ask ourselves a question, what would the Rebbe tell us? Because the Rebbe would tell us to look into the Torah, to look into Halacha, to look into Jewish tradition, to look into the wealth of his talks and his teachings and his letters to give us that moral direction in our lives. And my friends, when we take responsibility for Jewish destiny and we knock on the door and we touch the lives of another Jew, when we have the courage to speak up for the Jewish people, no matter who tells us not to speak up for the Jewish people, whoever it will be, and when we realize that when it comes to the moral dilemmas in our lives, that the, that the light should illuminate us, should be the light of Torah, the light of Chassidus, the teachings of the Rebbe, then there's no question, my friends, we will transform this world, we will uplift it, and together soon we'll be in Yushalayim with Mashiach. Thank you very much. Yeah.